Good evening and welcome to the Ignatian Family Teach-In Breakout Session entitled Becoming a Field Hospital for the Wounded in Central Mississippi, the Church Response to the 2019 Ice Raids and the Coronavirus Pandemic. My name is Sue Weischer and I am the Policy and Research Fellow at the Jesuit Social Research Institute at Loyola University, New Orleans. JSRI is a collaborative project of Loyola University and the Jesuits of the USA Southern and Central Province. JSRI conducts advocacy, education, and research on issues having to do with race, poverty, and migration in the Gulf South. I have worked at JSRI since 2010 and am the moderator for tonight's discussion, which will feature Father Roberto Mena, the sacramental minister at two churches located in communities hard hit by the 2019 raids and the pandemic, and Ms. Mary Townsend, the executive director of El Pueblo, a faith-inspired nonprofit that has become deeply involved in serving the legal and social service needs of immigrants in central Mississippi since the raids and throughout the pandemic. I want to remind viewers to send us any questions you may have during the presentation, just send them into the chat box and then Mary and I will respond to your questions live. Unfortunately, uh, Father Roberto will be saying mass when you see this broadcast. He's a very busy man. Okay, let's begin. On August 7th, 2019, 680 Latino immigrant workers were arrested at seven chicken processing plants in central Mississippi. After a terrifying day, about half the workers arrested, mainly women in, with small children at home, were released with electronic monitoring devices on their ankles. After a terrifying day, most of the other workers were transported to immigrant detention centers and isolated locations in central Louisiana. Numerous organizations, local, regional, and national, became immersed in responding to the many complex needs of families and individuals impacted by the raids. This evening, we will explore the pivotal role that Mississippi churches and a faith-inspired nonprofit played in assisting traumatized immigrant families and communities torn apart by the raids, and then how these organizations seven months later provided assistance to immigrants in these same communities that had become hot spots for the coronavirus pandemic. In 2013, Pope Francis said that the church should be like a field hospital for the, for the wounded. Mary, could you please read what um, Pope Francis said up on our slide? Mm -hmm. He said, the church's ministers must be merciful, take responsibility for the people, and accompany them like the Good Samaritan who washes, cleans, and raises up his neighbor. This is pure gospel. The ministers of the gospel must be people who can warm the hearts of the people, who walk through the dark night with them, who know how to dialogue and to descend themselves into their people's night, into the darkness, but without getting lost. We will first discuss how the Catholic Church in Central Mississippi became a field hospital for the wounded after the 2019 raids. Father Roberto Mena, you can see him in this photo, and of course on your screens, is a member of the Mississippi Servants of the Most Holy Trinity and, and is originally from Guatemala City, Guatemala. He serves as the sacramental minister at St. Michael the Archangel for Church in Forest, Mississippi, and St. Martin de Porras Church in Morton, Mississippi, two communities hard hit by the raids. Thanks for being here tonight, Father Roberto. And here's my first question to you. Where are most of the Latino families from in your parishes? And about how many families at the parishes you serve were impacted by the raids? Families mostly from Guatemala, so the population, I will say 60% Hispanic, 10% people from Vietnam, and 30% of other nationalities. Okay. And, and the number, 
of yes. people that they were taken that day of the rapes is 670. Oh, okay, thank but you. But not only from Forrest and Morton, but includes also Carthage and, and Canton. And about how many of that total were from your parishes? We had uh, 140 families impacted. Wow. Do you know how many of your parishioners have been deported and how many are still in detention? In detention, we have uh, three members of our church and we had like 80 people that they were deported, especially to Guatemala. Wow, that's, that's three people still in detention over a year later. What were some of the most pressing needs of your parishioners that you responded to um, after the raids? Because they were shocked uh, of, because they were taken from their place of work. So that day was very terrible for them because they had to go to Perl to file all their information. It was a long day for them. Then they were taking uh, like eight in the morning and they finished at 11 p.m. in the detention centers in Louisiana. So a day journey that they had. So that was really a shock for them and not only for them, but for their families and their children. Imagine it was the first day of school and the kids uh, were informed after they finished their classes that the parents were taken uh, to the detention centers. And some of the, of the churches help in having them in a gymnasium, giving them food, and then also contacting the family so they could come, the other members of family, to take care of the kids. That's just so tragic. Now you have been very active in advocacy efforts on behalf of immigrants impacted by the raids. You've been quoted in numerous media organizations listed on the screen, the New York Times, the LA Times, CNN, The Economist. Uh, what, when speaking to the media, this might be helpful for other people, other pastors that may find themselves in your situation. I, I pray to God that doesn't happen. But what were some of the core messages you tried to convey to the media when you were speaking to them? First, I tried to let them know that our task was giving hope to the immigrants and their families in this difficult situation. And also, I told them how the children were suffering from post-traumatic stress, how they uh, had problems in the school. Some of them were depressed or they had anxiety issues. So it means that the families were really affected. So we were really helping the families, not only uh, through giving them food, but also uh, asking uh, some organization of the church to give psychological help to them. Wow, that's wonderful. And I know that you were also um, uh, were very involved in helping to organize a visit from Guatemala of Cardinal Alvaro Ramazzini. And that was just four months after the raids, so it was just before Christmas. Could you tell us um, why this was important for your parishioners? to hear from um, Cardinal Ramazzini? Especially because Cardinal Ramazzini was the bishop in San Marcos where a lot of the people come from. So uh, they wanted to have their pastor near them because uh, they know that he was in charge of the immigration in the conference of bishop so he could be a, a good person to advocate for them, not only in the United States, but also in the government of Guatemala. So uh, he really was a link of uh, not only the church, but the government too. So that's why his visit was 
is so really important for the souls of the people to encourage them to continue having faith. And it was good because it was in the time when we had the posadas right before Christmas. Wow. So it was a, a hope for them that they received from him. And he also was encouraged to continue working for immigrants. Thank you so much. That was such, I, I was so glad I could hear him speak. Thank you so much. Now we're going to hear from um, Miss Mary Townsend. Uh, she is the executive director of El Pueblo, a faith-inspired nonprofit based in Biloxi and Forest, Mississippi, that's again, hard hit, impacted by the raids, that provides legal and social services to and advocates with vulnerable immigrants. Mary is a fully accredited immigration representative and has worked for over 22 years serving immigrant communities in her home state of Mississippi. Thanks for being with us tonight, Mary. Um, Mary, my first question is, when did you fear, first hear about the raids and what were some of the first actions you took as executive director of El Pueblo to respond to the raids? Hi, Sue. Well, I first heard about the raids on the day they happened, August 7th, uh, when we were contacted to participate on a conference call to respond to the raids. The first thing we needed to do was to find places to meet with the affected people to do legal screenings. I had worked in that area years before and I knew some of the churches in the area. So I immediately contacted Father Mike O'Brien of Sacred Heart Catholic Parish in Canton, Mississippi, and got permission to use his parish center as a base of operations. Then I suggested we contact Trinity Mission Center of the United Methodist Church in Forest, Mississippi, and I helped to contact them as well. Two days later, on August 9th, I drove up to central Mississippi and stayed there for about five days doing legal screenings and helping to assess the needs. And that was how I spent at least half of my time from then until February of this year when the pandemic put a stop to that kind of travel. Wow. Mayor, was there a coordinated response to the raids? And how did that come about? And what role did Catholic Charities of Jackson play in helping to realize a coordinated response? There absolutely was a coordinated response. On that day of the raids, a coalition of over 20 local, regional, and national organizations was formed called the Mississippi Immigration Coalition. It included immigrant advocacy and social justice organizations, law firms, labor unions, and churches. Catholic Charities Jackson was involved from the beginning. The coalition had set up a humanitarian aid fund to help the affected families pay rent and utilities since the main breadwinner was detained or otherwise not allowed to work. Catholic Charities from Jackson was designated by the coalition to administer that fund because it was a trusted organization with contacts in all the affected communities. It was a huge undertaking since over 680 families had just lo lost all or most of their income. The coalition raised over $400,000 for that fund and Catholic Charities, along with volunteers in each of the five towns affected, really did a magnificent job identifying the families and dispersing the money for rent and utilities. Catholic Charities also raised a good bit of money on its own to help those affected families. Wow, really becoming a field hospital for the wounded. Um, Mary, what have been some of the major ways that your organization, El Pueblo, has also assisted families impacted by the raids? First, as I said, I spent half my time in the area doing legal screenings and some of my staff traveled with me when they could. In the process, I discovered that there were a number of people who could have qualified for work authorization even before the raids, but they just didn't know it. So for the undocumented, having to drive 45 minutes to an hour to consult with an immigration attorney in Jackson is a dangerous proposition. Many law enforcement uh, people routinely pull over folks who look Hispanic on trumped up traffic violations. Instead of giving them a ticket like they would to you or me, they arrest them. And once they end up in detention with the sheriff, they'll be reported to immigration and started on the road to deportation. So nearby access to pro bono immigration legal services was really needed. 
When El Pueblo received a significant increase in donations because of the raids, it gave us the opportunity to open a branch office there in Forest. Forest is within just a few miles of both Morton and Carthage, two other small towns with chicken plants that were raided. So once our office was staffed, we were able to provide professional free trauma counseling to children affected by the raids and to adult trauma victims as well. We started a women's self-help group that's been very active in the community, and we've provided school supplies and instructions in both Spanish and indigenous languages for everything from how to enroll in college to hurricane preparedness to COVID-19. We help people to know their rights and to prepare for any emergency. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that many of, our, of the people impacted were are, are indigenous people from, um, from Guatemala. Uh, um, I refer to uh, El Pueblo as a faith-inspired nonprofit. How does your Catholic faith uh, shape your work with El Pueblo? Well, my faith not only shapes my work, it's my total motivation for it. Um, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Christ's description of the last judgment had become my guiding light. I was convinced that God was calling me to meet him in the poor, the homeless, and the stranger. So in 1998, I quit my job as a computer systems analyst and looked for a place to be of service. It didn't take long to get connected with Hispanic ministry in Forest, Mississippi at St. Michael's Catholic Church. That was before Father Roberto was there. <laughs> and during the eight years I spent there, I worked in Forest at St. Michael's and at Trinity Mission Center, in Morton at the Catholic Center, and in Carthage teaching ESL at one of the chicken plants. I also spent two years establishing the immigration clinic at Catholic Charities in Jackson. After Hurricane Katrina struck the Mississippi coast in 2005, I, I needed to get back to my hometown to help my family recover from the storm. Many immigrants had also gone to the coast to work in the cleanup and recovery. El Pueblo was born in 2006 to meet the needs of those immigrants and their families. I feel very privileged and it is truly the joy of my life to be able to serve Christ in the immigrant communities here in Mississippi. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to discuss the, the, how you all have served immigrants through the pandemic. Um, as we mentioned, central Mississippi is home to seven chicken processing plants. The working conditions in these plants create a perfect storm for the coronavirus transmission. Workers are unable to maintain the recommended six feet of distance on the processing floor. They breathe heavily while doing strenuous work and have to shout to be heard over loud machinery, possibly spreading virus particles in the cold air. Father Roberto, um, uh, about how many members of your parishes have been impacted by the coronavirus and has anyone died? We had like 110 uh, families affected from Morton and also from a uh, forest. And uh, we only have one person died. But he was Hispanic, but uh, his family come to the church. So we had a great sight for him. And all that, I'm so sorry. What, what have you, as well as Catholic Charities Jackson, been able to do to, to help your parishioners survive the pandemic? I think the most important part of our work is getting the information there. So we ask a lot of organizations to send us information in Spanish and also in the indigenous languages of MAM and also Chuk. So I contact the Conference of Bishop Guatemala. They send me some videos through YouTube and they were able to see all the consequences of the disease for, in their own language. And also the health department uh, sent us uh, some posters that we post in the laundry machines and the places where a lot of people gather in both towns. So uh, also in the church and then uh, we give some uh, local information of uh, where uh, to get tested. So all of this, uh, we did it in the, all in the boxes, in the 
that they have for mail in each house. Beautiful, valuable work. Now, Father Roberto, you were the one that told me that early in the pandemic, immigrants who actually some had to go back to work in the plant because they couldn't, they had no other choice to feed their families. Suddenly these immigrants had been arrested in August, 2019, now started to get letters from their employers saying that, uh, that the government said they were essential workers and uh, they should be allowed to proceed to work. Um, what, what did you think about those letters in light of what happened with the raids, you know, just seven months earlier? I think there was a step from being undocumented and wanted by the law to be essential workers in seven months. And uh, I think that was a hypocrisy of the immigration system because the same people arrested uh, and also some of them had their uncle monitors and the people now they were needed for the production of uh, the chicken poultry in the area so they give them not only the letters but also a, like a little id that they will show to the police so if they stop them they will know that they were going to work so until now they have these ids and these letters so uh, especially when we have a lot of people inside their houses in quarantine so they could go to work. So some of them, even they get to work even sick and they didn't know because they were not tested and the companies didn't provide them the testing that they need. Well, thank you for being there and advocating and just like you said, just the, a stunning hypocrisy from our government and um, uh, shameful. Mary, I know that uh, El Pueblo has been very involved in working with the communities uh, uh, since the coronavirus as well. Um, a major theme of this year's uh, Ignatian Family Teaching is how people of faith can help build up individual and collective capacities for healing and justice. So how has El Pueblo helped immigrants in central Mississippi build up individual and collective capacities for healing and justice since the pandemic started? Well, we were already doing that before the pandemic struck. Our Mujeres Unidas group, that means Women United, was already organizing activities to help women who had been affected by the raids to grow in solidarity and community. The women met weekly to do or to learn almost anything they were interested in. Immediately, El Pueblo contracted with two licensed trauma therapists to provide counseling and trauma therapy to help the women and their children overcome the very real trauma that they had experienced in the raids. That therapy is provided free of charge and locally at our office in Forest. So when the pandemic struck, this group of ladies was already well positioned to engage in healing and justice activities. More than 95% of these women were either arrested in the raids and released with ankle monitors or their spouse had been arrested and was still in detention centers far away. They were already supporting each other in friendship and solidarity. Suddenly this highly infectious disease began making people very ill and the ladies came to us and said, teach us to sew. So teach them we did. And they made over 1,700 protective face masks, which they distributed free to the local hospital, to clinics, Latin stores, and finally to the same chicken plants they were working at when they were arrested because they were not providing personal protective equipment to their staff. Then they started making child-sized masks and gave them to children to use when school started again. The trauma counseling that we began after the raids continued and the Mujeres Unidas group um, continued to celebrate anything they could find a reason for. They celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month. They celebrated the first anniversary of the raids and they held a long delayed quinceanera for a 30 something mother who never got to have hers 
because of poverty and family abuse. And that was a beautiful and very uh, happy celebration. Very healing, yeah. Now, how can people watching us tonight, how can they help the, the families impacted by the coronavirus pandemic in central Mississippi that were also impacted by the raids in August 2019? Well, um, one of the big needs that, that really surfaced, especially after the pandemic started, was food scarcity because people who had already lost one breadwinner now were lo losing all of their income because of the pandemic. So you can help by supporting El Pueblo's Food for Our Neighbors program. We provide a box of non-perishable groceries once a week to any family that has lost their income due to COVID-19. There's a GoFundMe link on our Facebook page uh, whenever possible, we partner with other organizations like the Mississippi Mutual Aid Group of the Mississippi Rising Coalition to provide fresh produce to go along with those food boxes. We've given out hundreds of boxes of much needed food, both in Forest and in Biloxi. And, and don't forget to pray for the immigrant community and pray for El Pueblo that we will always be a sign and an agent of God's great love and mercy. Now, let's talk about advocacy. What kind of advocacy efforts need to happen to address the injustices you, you have witnessed over the past year in Central Mississippi immigrant communities? There's so much advocacy that's needed around immigration. And the best thing that I can encourage people to do is to contact your elected representatives and, and senators in Congress and just ask them to work for just and compassionate immigration reform. Specifically, you can ask them to uh, support the DREAM Act, to make the, benefit, uh, the benefits of DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, permanent for young people who were brought to the U.S. as children and who don't really know any other home. You could ask them to do away with the three and 10 year unlawful presence bars that prevent millions of people in this country from gaining permanent resident status through their family members. And you can ask them to increase the number of immigrant and work visas that are available each year. There's just not enough visas available. It's a ridiculously no low number. And we routinely run out of visas every year, especially for work visas and U visas for, for victims of crime. Yeah, thank you everybody. Please, please note this and please do this. Thank you both so much for everything that you've provided us tonight, the insights you've provided and all the great work that you have been doing to serve the, uh, our immigrant sisters and brothers in, in central Mississippi. Let's, let's close tonight with a prayer. Let's, let's say this prayer all together. People watching, please say this as well. A prayer to Jesus the immigrant. You were a vulnerable family in a foreign land looking for shelter and sustenance. Help us to welcome those like you who cross our borders today and live in our communities. Give us hearts of compassion, humane response, and laws that respect the dignity of all immigrants. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you all so much. Um, if, if you uh, need to contact or would you like to hear more from uh, Mary Townsend or our Father Roberto, you can contact me at the Jesuit Social Research Institute at Loyola University, New Orleans, uh, or uh, uh, check them out both online, doing very, very important work. And we're so grateful. Uh, it is exhausting work and the trauma, the, the injustice overwhelming. It's so good to know that you all are part of being the church of the wounded for our immigrant sisters and brothers in central Mississippi. We have about, uh, I think about uh, 40 seconds left. And so now um, with this remaining time, Mary and I are going to respond live to your uh, your questions. Thank you again, Mary Townsend and uh, Father Roberta. Thank you for having me.